a denomination called the Christian Churches Disciples of Christ. The reason why we are called Christian Churches Disciples of Christ is because we have founders. Our founders were Thomas and Alexander Campbell, okay? And these guys called themselves, oops, <laughs> disciples, okay? Their movement was called disciples, disciples of Christ. Then we have a guy named Barton Stone. Barton Stone called his movement <laughs> Christians. The Christian Church's Disciples of Christ is literally the very first American, U.S. American denomination uh, that came and birthed fully from this country. All the other denominations came. Now, there are other denominations that have propped up and cropped up since then, but literally, um, Campbell's and Stone were doing work, um, and then they were not, they did not start denominations, all right? These were movements. The one was called a disciples movement. The Campbell's called it that. Stone called his the Christian church movement or the Christian movement, called, we're Christians, right? And they did not want to create a denomination. Now, the Campbells came from across the pond. Stone came from here. The Campbells were, uh, the disciples movement, the disciples movement is one that really, the, the main word is restoration. It's a restoration movement. The Christian movement and the Stones movement was a unity movement. Now, both the Campbells and the Stone, uh, and Stones, or Stone, believed uh, that we in America <clears throat> needed to, in some way, kind of get back to the basics and get back to the Bible and follow the Bible more. And, and there was too much politics and too much world and too much society that was influencing Christianity and churches in the new world, which by the way, it was not a new world. There were already people here and we kicked them out and did genocide and all this. All right. So that's like, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but these guys believed that, um, so, so restoration, the idea was we need to restore the church back to biblical times, like the church looked like in Acts, in the book of Acts, right? We got to get back to the Acts church and do what the Acts church did, which by the way, theologians for 2000 years have argued what that looked like, all right? So whatever, uh, that was their deal. We need to restore the entire church, right? From most, uh, <laughs> mostly Protestant church. They, they were pretty anti-Roman Catholic. I mean, these were guys that believed that the Pope was the Antichrist, right? So we have some fun DNA. But uh, so they, when they were talking about restoring the whole church, they would kind of kick out the Roman Catholic because they didn't really believe they were church. Church history is just fun. So anyways, but they wanted to restore the whole church and that there shouldn't be any denominations. There should just be one big movement, restoration movement that are, and we all should be disciples of Christ, all learning how to become students of Jesus and do the Jesus thing, okay? Unity movement then, similarly, Stone wanted to get all Christians together and unified, right? And be like, the Acts Church, right? Um, but unity was, uh, Stone was a little bit more, a little bit more open to bringing <clears throat> other influences into this unity movement. So he liked to have Presbyterians and Baptists and Lutherans and Episcopalians and, right, uh, all a part of one big thing. And you could still call yourself a Presbyterian or a Lutheran or an Episcopal or whatever. Um, so Stone was a little bit more open 
Uh, Campbell's were a little bit more inc- exclusive and very much so. So a restoration movement by its very nature will say, we're going to restore it to this and this is the only right way. And you need to join us and figure out that this is the only right way. A unity movement by its very nature is much more unifying. It's like, well, it's okay to have a little bit different. I mean, like one of the arguments was about baptism, right? Still in the early parts of America, the argument about can you have infant baptism and, or should, if you've been baptized as a, as a Lutheran, should you get rebaptized if you come into this movement or this church? Uh, and some churches believe that no, the only baptism that counts is the baptism that you get in our church because we're the one true real church. So that baptism doesn't count. Right, and then there were others that said, "No, let's just." Do it. And Stone was again much more inclusive, much more like, "Hey, if you've been baptized, good. I don't care. You were baptized in a Lutheran church, a Baptist church, you know, a, a Methodist church. Awesome, you're in." Right? Whereas the Campbells were like, "No, yeah, you have to do it the right way." You're right. So, anyways, you can tell I'm a little bit more Stony than I am Campbelly. All right. So now. Now, what the reason that we have now a thing, a denomination called the Christian churches, and that's a parenthesis, disciples of Christ, that's our denomination, is because the Campbells and Stone actually joined together, had enough in common that they decided to unify their movements. And so they started becoming called or known as the Christian movement and disciples of Christ movement, Christian and disciples. So that's where we got the name and just stuck. Now, I'm going to go through a lot of this stuff, um, or not, I'm going to skip a ton of stuff, right? These guys, the two movements basically took the, the attitude and the feelings of their leaders, so there, even though we were unified or, or the movements had merged, there was really always still kind of a Christian stone movement and a Campbell disciples movement. And the people, and both of these guys, uh, Alexander Campbell, especially Alexander Campbell wrote prolifically. He wrote all the time and had back what they would be like today they would be like blogs and facebook posts and stuff it was just constant and they were being mailed out to all the people on the mailing list especially the disciples and that was and even in the and stone wrote too and and not as prolifically but a lot we have a lot of writing for and it was all it was it was monthly publications that were going out constantly all right now in those publications Campbell and Stone were actually arguing with each other. So the people that were more Stone oriented and, and Christian oriented, meaning Christian in the movement, not Christian as a like I'm a Christian, you know, but in the Christian movement, they kind of sided with Stone and the other guys sided with other people decided sided with Campbell. Now that ran through forever. And the Christian church, Disciples of Christ, one of the main things that they decided is they would never become a denomination. And that was how they were going to keep it pure, right? Because denominations or institutions that were now led by men and not by God, right? Um, now, what happened was uh, <laughs> these, these people started to realize that, that in America, in the... 40s, 50s, and 60s, this movement was still going, Christian churches, disciples of Christ. Um, they, they, were, they had missionary work. They had all kinds of work in the civil rights movement. Different things were coming up. And they wanted, have you ever heard of the word ecumenical? That we, ecumenical means that we're going to work across denominations, so if we're Baptists, we're going to work with Methodists, and, we're, and Methodists work with Presbyterians. In fact, if we can just get every denomination together, that's an ecumenical group meeting. Are you with me? And so no one denomination is running it. It's ecumenical. It's, it's we're all in this together. Now, what was happening, because we were doing a ton of ecumenical work with all these other denominations, because we were not officially and legally a denomination, 
We were being excluded from being able to do certain things, not because people wanted to exclude us, but because we didn't literally have bylaws and constitution and legality to do things. So we were being left out out of a lot of the ecumenical work that the Christian church's disciples of Christ wanted to do. So in 1964, um, our movement, Church Christ or uh, Christian Church Disciples of Christ started pushing to go towards denomination and becoming a denomination legally bound and legally recognized in the United States, right? And around the world. So, uh, pastors, so this is in 1964. There wasn't going to be a meeting until like 1968. They started working on their congregations about four years before to get all the congregations on board to say, this is a good thing. Now, now, out of these two movements, which ones do you think were more open to becoming a denomination and which ones were more closed to becoming a denomination? Campbell's and Disciples, were they open or more closed? They were more closed. Stone and Christians were more open in unity, and right? So this group was, their pastors were not excited about this vote coming up in 1968. They did not want to become a denomination because we're going to restore to all to the things back in the Bible. And if you become a denomination, then you're just part of the evil hypocrisy of, of denominational problems, right? So um, in 1968, it was the almost unanimous vote in their general convention to become a denomination. And I wrote this down because this is this was pretty pretty interesting. In um, at the time, at the time in 1968 when they voted, all right, that was the vote. There were over 6,000 Church of Christ disciples of uh, Christ, Church Christian Church disciples of Christ. So that's why I hate the name. The Christian Church disciples of Christ are over 6,000 congregations. Now they were in a movement together. They met in general conventions and stuff like that. They still did a lot of work together. So they had numbers. They kind of knew who was in, but it was not a formal official denomination. So they knew at that time in 1968, there were over 6,000. Now you had to have a two thirds vote to become a denomination or to pass any resolution. Well, these, this little group right here, decided to basically not go to the convention. So the vote in 1968 was virtually unanimous. I think there was like one or two uh, congregations that voted no. It was basically, so it looked like we had overwhelming support for denominational status. <clears throat> well, the problem was, is the pastors of the disciples churches and the Campbell churches just didn't show up. So the very next year, the very next year, I'm literally not kidding. The very next year in the yearbook, which we still have yearbook rolls to this day, we're on them. The very next year, they had 2,300 churches leave <laughs> and it left 4,046 total churches. So basically, 2,000 congregations left in one year right after that vote. So we had what most <laughs> denominations experience in their life, a denominational split right off the bat, right? So we went down to that. Now, in 2016, so I know that that's a while ago, but this is just the numbers I have. We were back up to 3,200 total uh, uh, numbers of congregations in Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Now, the people that stayed, this 4,000, these are really these people right here. They're really stone, Christian movement, and unity people. All right? The Disciples of Christ, and this is, I have a thing, I didn't bring it, because, but in 1972, so this is what, four years after 68, is that four years? After 68, after the vote. In 1972, there is, a, there is now a publication that is, um, 
that is talking about how the DOC and the COC relate. Does anyone know what the COC stands for? Anyone? Church of Christ. How many of you ever heard of Church of Christ? Anyone? How many of you grew up in the Church of Christ? Anyone here? No one here? Okay, good. <laughs> um, um, so in 1972, well, so why do we have a publication talking about how the DOC churches relate to the COC churches? Because those 2,300 almost, now not all of them, some of them created independent disciples and independent churches of Christ. And we've created out of this non-denominational meaning, we don't want to be denomination. There have been about five denominations created. Now, the, except for the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ is not an official denomination in America to this day. What happened was most of those 2,300 congregations became churches of Christ. And now we have a Disciples of Christ and Church of Christ. How do we relate to each other? Now, I don't like that we kept the name Disciples of Christ because that was Campbell. Campbell was Disciples. Stone was Christian. What we should be called is the Christian church. <laughs> But that's not for me to change because I just joined the DOC about four years ago. So I should probably keep my mouth shut for a while. Now, but I, honestly, I'm really not kidding. The, the movement of the DOC, this is why this is important. Are you ready? I'm, now I'm getting to why this is important. The reason this is important is because our heritage in the Christian churches is a heritage of Barton Stone. It's a man who was much more about unity much a man that was much more about inclusion. He was a man that was much more outspoken about slavery and how it was wrong than the Campbells ever were. In fact, the Campbells, there's evidence of them being full-blown racist. Now, Stone was not perfect. Stone let slaves and free blacks come to their meetings, but then wanted them to have their own churches and would help them build their own churches but he wanted to still segregate Sunday mornings, a horrible, horrible DNA part of our history, but still much more inclusive back in the 1800s than the Campbells were, amen? Uh, Stone was also a guy that um, he went to revivals and, and, and I'm talking about like the crazy charismatic revivals where people were dancing and barking and running around. I'm not kidding. And like shaking and falling out in the spirit and speaking in tongues. That was Barton Stone. Barton Stone did that. And he brought one of the most famous um, revivals. It's called the Cane Ridge Revival. Barton Stone helped create and, and run the Cane Ridge, where literally in this tiny little place out in the middle of nowhere, there would be 30,000 people a week come through to the revivals of Cane Ridge. Barton Stone was, was much more a man of the spirit, was much more about inclusiveness, was much more about unity and openness and letting people become a part of this thing instead of trying to stiff arm them and keep them away. I think that's a pretty darn good DNA history to have. Now, not perfect, not nearly, I mean, still some patriarchy, still some misogyny, still some racism, um, a product of his society for sure. But by golly, a guy that was really on the edges of changing that kind of behavior and attitudes. Amen. And that's why I, I did a whole, uh, in my history and polity class for Disciples of Christ, uh, I did a whole pa a paper on stone and this other guy, but mainly Stone, because I, I, I'm, I'm a Stoneite. I'm not a Campbellite, I'm a Stoneite. Um, and I'm definitely not a Campbellite. I mean, I'm seriously, like the teachings and stuff of Campbell, I, I have real serious issues with. Um, if you go to the Churches of Christ and you listen to them, they will call themselves a restoration movement, a Campbellite movement. They are all for the Campbells. And, and, and I mean, I'm just telling you that teaching, that DNA gets in you and the churches of Christ, I love them, but I have lots and lots of friends and there's some that are here, um, not obviously today, but that are here that are members of this place. And they have had serious church hurt because of the misogyny, the abuse, the religious kind of abuse that happens there. Um, it is extremely patriarchal, extremely abusive types of religious abuse 
that happened. And, and I'm, you know, when you read what Campbell wrote, you can see, well, if you carry that through, then and if you're a Campbellite movement, I can see why that would be, a, you'd have some issues. Stone, much more inclusive, much more about unity, much more about, hey, let's just make this thing work however we need to make it work. Amen? So the churches of Christ, uh, or the, the Christian church, disciples of Christ now, um, is a movement that really is much more in the DNA of Stone and Barton Stone in his writings. And we are inclusive. We are a church that is a denomination that is, is radically working towards anti-racism, is radically working towards LGBTQ, um, IA plus uh, uh, initiatives that is radically committed to women uh, and women, women having voice and using their voices and being ordained and all that kind of stuff. There's nothing in our denomination that would hold down any person that is, now congregations, we have the right, we're autonomous, but the denomination as a whole has said, we're for women, we're for LGBTQ, we're for anti-racism, and these are the initiatives we're going after. In fact, to this day, or right now at this day, uh, our, what we call general president, which is I like call it the Pope, the Pope of the DOC is Terry Hoard Evans, and she is a woman, and she is black. So we have, the only one she doesn't knock off there is she's not LGBTQ. She's, she's uh, married to a man, and, but, that, but she's extremely pro-LGBTQ, extremely pro, pro all of the other initiatives that we're doing, very involved in the BLM movement and speaking out uh, during that time when the George, after the George Floyd. I was extremely proud to be a part of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ during this movement right now. Um, that's why I'm a part of the DOC. That's why I love it because we're a stone movement. One of the things I said in my polity class is like, I think we need to start going to the general assembly and we all just wear our shirts that we make that says we need to get stoned. And we just need to just get more and more stoned. We just need to get the, the heart and the love and the unity of Barton Stone needs to just run through our veins more and more as a, as a congregation and more and more as a denomination. That's our story as a denomination. I'm going to have Jamie or Catherine very quickly share um, just a little bit about how simplicity started and because uh, it's a very interesting story. And then I'll finish this up with a prayer and... and uh, say maybe a couple other things after that. A man named Michael Canada um, reached out to me. He saw me playing in a bookstore. Uh, I used to do lots of gigs. And um, so he reached out and asked if I would be willing to um, join him on an adventure. And I said, well, that's very vague, but all right, let's have a meeting. Um, so we did. I, he basically was trying to plant a new disciples church within the first Christian church of Oklahoma City. The it's the, the Big Egg, the Boob Church. Um, yeah, on 33rd, no, 36, thank you, 36 and Walker. Um, that lasted about eight months. It did not work out well. Um, they were trying to um, get something a little bit more contemporary, which is why they sought me. Um, and, you know, so Brian, who plays the electric guitar, and, and Dalton, who's on the bass, they've all been uh, around since sort of that time. But, you know, when you have little 90-year-old ladies um, who are sitting in the audience, you know, covering their ears, yelling, this is shameful, um, it's not going to, it's probably not going to work out. So um, Michael left, and so we had a decision to make. Do we stay put where, you know, we were being paid, and they brought Catherine in to do kids, um, or do we sort of take a chance and go with Michael and see what that, that does? And we, we really believe that the only life that was really in that church, um, and I don't mean any disrespect by that, but he was sort of the heartbeat, and so we decided that we were going to venture out with him, and so... Catherine and I, and then a few other sort of core members, we launched Simplicity um, in September of 2017, I think, sorry. Um, <clears throat> and so we started meeting in, in uh, Plenty Mercantile in their event space. We met there for about seven months. Uh, it's a 
I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a single room, concrete walls. So, you know, Catherine was having to pull curtains and doing for kids what she was calling whisper lessons. Yeah, and it was, it was great. But after about six, seven months, we were really sort of outgrowing it. So we moved across the street to Water's Edge Winery, um, where it's a two-story, I don't know if you've been there, but it's a two-story building. And so we were able to have kids upstairs and music downstairs, and it was great. Um, and then on Good Friday, so about seven months after being there, um, and I, I, I lied, we were at the Mercantile for about four months. So about a year after Simplicity started, uh, Michael pulled us aside and let us know that uh, he and his family were going to have to move for personal reasons. Um, and they, they were going to be moving back to Indiana. And uh, so at that point, we didn't really quite know what to do. Um, we were going to be a church without a pastor, which is a really strange situation to be in. And, um, but the denomination who has been providing financial support to us, par yeah, a partial support, um, they, they supported us, they believed in us. So Catherine and I kind of took the baton along with Charlie and Joanne and Julie and Debbie and, and the twins. And I'm, I know I'm forgetting other people, but a, a, a core group of, of people who had basically been around since the entire time. And, um, so we moved out of the winery to sort of reevaluate what things looked like. And we emptied out our living room and we did house church for about eight months. And it, it, it really, it kind of worked. Like it was one of my favorite points. It was one of my favorite periods of time. Cause literally like we empty, we had just moved and we emptied out our living room and we had this screen in our living room. <laughs> And, and so we had some of like these chairs just set up and it was so intimate and it was really, uh, I'm sure people thought we were insane and we are insane. If you, uh, but it was a really good time. You did, yeah, he did. And, and so, uh, yeah, most people who have come in the last few years, they don't realize that there are several years of Simplicity's history that precede Israel coming in. And, um, when Michael left, he begged us to bring Israel in, but um, it just, it wasn't a good time at that point in everyone's lives. And so anyway, after about eight months of house church, we um, were like, we have to get out of our living room because we were actually starting to grow a little bit. And so um, just a crazy, we got an email through our website from a woman, uh, I guess they were a disciples community and they were closing their doors. And um, as, as is happening, um, not infrequently, the disciples are like most churches, they're in the decline. And um, so she said that they had a few things for us and a small um, cash offering that they would like to give to us to help support us. So Catherine and I got in my big red pickup truck at the time, uh, and we drove down to this place thinking, well, great, you know, we'll get maybe some chairs and some tables and whatever. So they, they had all of this furniture, um, the tables that we eat on, many of the chairs that we have in here, um, uh, communion table, all, yeah, altars, all, all that stuff. And then they passed us a check and said, here, hopefully, like, you know, this will help with the U-Haul. And it was a $40,000 check. <laughs> And, and so uh, it, 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 it just, it really does go to show just how truly generous and, and forward thinking the disciples are. Um, it's, I didn't grow up in church at all. Um, so I'm sort of the opposite of many people who have the sort of church hurt. Um, and it's honestly probably why this does not feel like most churches. So much of our DNA is in it. And we decided that if we were going to do this, we were going to do it our way. And um, so fast forward a little bit, we get the warehouse space, we renovate it, and we decide, okay, now we, we really do need a pastor. And so Michael, he had been providing video messages for about seven months, eight months, and he was going to take a sabbatical um, for a, a few while weeks while he was, about a yeah, he was doing this. He was. He was doing us a huge favor. And honestly, we wouldn't have been able to keep it going without him providing those things. So during the, his three or four week sabbatical, I 
said, well, hey, Catherine, what do you think about Israel filling in for us? And she said, that would be great. So Iz and I sat down for coffee to sort of chat through it. And we were just kind of, because we have a very long, complicated backstory. But uh, so we're just kind of catching up a little bit and, you know, kind of making small talk. And then I was asking Israel, like, so what, what's going on with you? What are you? And he was in the Episcopal Church at the time, and he was about to begin his aspirancy. Is that yeah. what that's? So he's talking through his vision for church and what he wanted to do with, you know, ministry when he got to it. And he was talking about how he couldn't do another Edmund, you know, upper middle class, predominantly white, homogenous community. Um, and you just need to tell him what you said when you came home to me. So, so, so I, so I, I, as he's talking, I literally, I was just like, it would just make so much sense if you were our pastor. <laughs> like we're, you're a, you're a pastor without a church and we're a church without a pastor. Like this just jives. Like, so we did, we went, we created a, a board, um, because that was a decision that we felt we shouldn't make on our own unilaterally. And, uh, the board that we created is largely still intact. Charlie back here. Yeah. Um, and so we officially voted Israel in, uh, I think it was the summer of 2018. And we've, yeah, and we have been wreaking havoc ever since. Uh, making, yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll stop talking. I grew up in DOC. I grew up in the Big Boob Egg Church. That's where I went. So when Michael and Michelle called him and said, let's do this, I had done church with Israel before, some church, serious church burn. We've known each other since, gosh, I was 23. Um, and we've been through some incredible struggles together um, between the two of us in our lives. And so I love Israel. I've loved Israel my whole life and will love him till the day I die. But we needed some space from each other because our lives were so intertwined and complicated. So I was like, it's been, I'll call you on the phone every now and then. It's been good. I love you. Bye. So um, church was tough for me. So when Michael called, I said, no, 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 we're not doing that. You, no. Um, but then he said, well, he's working out of DOC, the big egg. And I went, oh my gosh, because I grew up there, my youth group, my life. I, my parents ran the youth and were deacons. And so it meant a lot. And they, I will say, even then, DOC was a church where you could be you and it was um, open-minded and tried to do it right. I mean, in the eighties for sure. Um, and so I thought, well, gosh, that's a tempting. And then, um, actually where we teach at Heritage Hall, that's where Heritage Hall started was in that same building. Um, and I just thought, this is just, I'll go meet them, I guess. And Michael and Michelle were so good about saying, he said, I'm not church, a church person. And he said, perfect. You're not messed up. You'll be great. So it kind of just fell into place. And then when they left, I was like, that's it. I don't want to do it. And then um, our community said, let's please do this. And the DOC commission said, we trust you guys, which is in a church is incredibly interesting because we aren't church people. And I said, okay, I will do this, but I'm going to go to Pam. And she's the one that oversees the church in this Oklahoma city area. And regional director who Pam is amazing and I said Pam I'll I want to do this I'm excited but these are the things I believe in and these are what I can't do and I want to build a church it's not really a church and where people can be you and it's all different and she said you'll be fine and if it gets if it gets to be too much I'll let you know but I don't think I'll have to tell you that and so then I thought oh, dad it, we have to do this um, so I say that to say DOC is not just our denomination, I've really been impressed with how they've handled our situation. They have struggled and they want to keep DOC strong and they wanna make it right, do it right. And so it makes it a lot easier to do this. And they've been a huge support to us, partially funding, um, helping Israel like with, with getting through to his schooling in a more affordable way. So it, it, it's, been, it's been good to be a part of something I believe in and being a part of a denomination is nice. Um, we, when we did our church role before, it was non-denominational, but I have really appreciated the denominational support as long as they back it up the beliefs that we believe in, which I've yet to offend them to the point that they've said, don't do that. <laughs> so I think that's worth saying. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So here we I are. I know, man. You're saying GD from the, uh, the yeah, Well, <laughs> let's take it up with not, shall we? Israel will always challenge the situation. We are, and many of you 
I probably already understand this and maybe you're here because of this. Uh, it's funny because I, I came in like right at the end of May, 1st of June of 2018. And we started, we were sitting down, I think over here, we were just talking one day after church and we started talking about, it was Pride Month. And we were talking about, man, we should really, like, it'd be cool if we could be a part of Pride Month somehow, you know, and like be a congregation that lets people know that we're safe and that we love them and stuff like that. And Lindy, Lindy just said, why don't we just like get, get, get in the Pride Parade? And um, out of that, literally, I mean, it was like, it's so funny because we we're all talking about like, how could we help? And how could, <laughs> she's like, why don't you just call up and get in the parade? I'm like, oh yeah, that's probably one way. So out of that little thing, it was so wonderful. Charlie was there that year. Um, we were running probably about 40 people, 40 people on a Sunday. And I think we had 36 people walk in the pride parade with simplicity that year, like almost the entire congregation came and we had the big red truck and we had a, like a sign that we made. I think we still have it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we, why? And then the next year we went in and we, this time we got another truck and got a flatbed and we did a trailer and we, we had even more, we had probably about 60 something people and then we had pandemic. Um, so hopefully we'll, and now we know that there's there's some discrepancies about how pride parades will work this next year because there's two different kinds of groups that are one's running one down in the district and one's going downtown. Um, Lindy and I were talking about that this week, and we were like, I, I think we should probably be a part of both because it's not it's not our job to say we believe in one and not the other. And we're not going to try to get political with it, and I know it's hard not to get political with when you have two different groups kind of vying for different things, but my deal is like everyone in that community is important to us. Um, whether you want to be in the district or you want to be downtown, that's not our issue. Our issue is we're a congregation that loves people that go to the district and loves people that go to the pride parade downtown, right? So that's our deal. We've also walked in the MLK parade last year before pandemic for the first time ever we did that because one of the things that we wanted to make sure was that we weren't just a church that was only about one kind of thing or one kind of, of, of marginalized group uh, or marginalized people that we were, were for all marginalized people's groups. And, and so we're going to try to keep on doing more and more of that. Um, now, next week, one of the things that we do, and you, again, you do not have to do this. This is not a requirement, but this is just something that we do if you want to do this to kind of feel a part. If it helps you feel more a part of the family, then you can do this. Um, if you don't want to, you don't have to. But one of the things that we do, so next Sunday, we will have um, a table set up up here. It's a big, long, like eight-foot table, six-foot table, and we have the white, um, you know, uh, tablecloth we have a bunch of candles on it there's like a, a couple of big candles and and we light those first because those represent people that have gone before us in our history people that have gone before us here at simplicity and uh and then uh, our leadership that is here and then we have little tea candle light thingies and then you we invite people that have come through the, the information class if they want to um they come and light their candle and all of the tea lights that are on there represent, and we don't have over a hundred because there's over a hundred now that have done this, but um, we have a lot of tea lights there and you light ones that are not lit yet so that you your light joins with our light and the light that has gone before us. I'm getting emotional so that we can continue to spread the light in a dark world. So that's our way of kind of having a little ceremony. So if you'd like to do that next week, we'll do that. If you can't be here next week, we do that every Sunday after we do a membership information class, okay? So if you want to pick up the next one, you can do that too. Or if you're not ready and you want to wait and see what it's like. So, okay. We should probably, one of the things that we should probably do, I was just thinking, we should probably talk about who's on the board and maybe show pictures so people can just know. But Charlie is on the board. Joanne, his wife, is actually not a board member, but she runs our books. Um, and she does come to board meetings a lot so that she can know what's going on and where we're going financially and all that kind of stuff. Robbie Herlocker, who has spoken, is on our board. Uh, Julie Pozos uh, is on our board. and You might not know who she is. Um, she has been here before. Yeah. 
Julie and Charlie and Debbie. Debbie, they all, Debbie was not here this morning. Debbie is on the board. Mike Arnett, uh, he, you want to be praying for him. He is, uh, his family is going through some uh, uh, physical, uh, you know, it's like sicknesses and stuff. So we really need to be praying for them. So Mike Arnett is on the board and is that it right now? I think that's it right now. So we're getting ready to, um, I think, add another one down the road here a little bit. But that's, so that's our board. Uh, we have people that are on the board that um, represent um, kind of all the different, yeah, Jen Davidson. She's the girl. Yeah. So that represent all kind of different groups. Um, and so uh, we're trying to make sure that that board is diverse in age, um, LGBTQ, uh, people of color, stuff like that. So we're working on, on trying to make it as, as far. But at the same time, you can't force people to be on the board, right? <laughs> and so we've asked some people and, and uh, that we thought would be great. And they're, they're holding off right now. And they're saying, I don't feel like it's the right timing for me. And that's okay. So we're still working on that. So, um, but we have a great board that, that meets, um, you know, several, several times a year. And we, we're, we're working through this stuff. So uh, I love them. They're amazing. And it helps people like Jamie and Catherine and I and Lindy do all the other work that we're doing. Yeah. So um, I love you. Let me pray for you. Any questions? The last time I'll give you a chance. Yeah. How aggressive can I be with my question? How aggressive can you be with your question? Now I'm interested. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I mean, as okay. aggressive as you need to be. Are there any rules about worship? Are there any rules about worship? Yeah. Like, I've been to a church where you couldn't raise your hand. No, you can, you can. You can yeah. Okay. There are people that are, at, that's a great question. There are people that are in our congregation that are much more demonstrative, I would say. And then there's a lot of people that are very, you know, like, you know, calm and collected and don't scare Jesus. Don't scare God. Um, Cause God's old and you don't want to be too loud. But uh, so there's, we have all, and, and there's no rule. I mean, if you want to raise your hand, do it. If you want to clap, do it. If you want to move around and dance, do it, you know. I, I personally tend to move around a little bit more and, and, and raise my hand every now and then and stuff like that. I, I just, I like to, I grew up in a more charismatic um, background. And so um, for me, I used to at the church that we used to be at, I would stand in the back because it was just, I, nobody was, I was aware that up here, I'm aware that people might be looking at me and it's a weird feel. Lindy and I have talked about that several times. She feels that too. It's like, I think people might be watching me. <laughs> so um, so it's kind of weird when you sit up front and you're like the pastor. So I used to just be in the back because so I could just go crazy and like dance around and do whatever. And um, but I also think it's important. I went to an Episcopal church and our our my priest, Father Joe Alse, um, <clears throat> was extremely demonstrative in worship. And in the Episcopal church, you you come in on a processional and then they all the leaders, clergy sit up front, and they have to. That's just the way the church works. And so, but Father Joe um, is a little short black man and uh, literally like he's about that tall and one of the most demonstrative outgoing and in an Episcopal church, you know, wearing the vestments and the whole thing. And he's like, ah! you know, and I'm like, dude, if he can do it, I can do it. So I'm just going to sit in the front and I'll just lead worship, you know, and we'll just go for it. So there is no, there's no rule. If you want to be demonstrative, go for it, have fun. How's that? That's a good question. That wasn't that aggressive. Come on. <laughs> All right. Well, we love you. Let me pray for you and I'll let you go and have the rest of your day together. Lord, we thank you for each and one of these beautiful children of God that are here this morning. I thank you that we have, uh, that we have a church that is really, really, really trying to be inclusive, be affirming, be loving with no strings attached. I pray that we would continue to strive to be that way, that we would recognize when we are not that way, that we would correct that, um, ask for forgiveness and move on into a better a better way and a better attitude and a better uh, action. 
We thank you for the history of those who've come before us all the way back to the Campbells in Barton Stone. We thank you for those like Michael Canada who also came and paved the way with Jamie and Catherine to start Simplicity. We thank you that we have found one another and we pray that we would be light in a dark world. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Love you all. Thank you so much. See you soon. Mm -hmm.